Well, welcome to Mission. I love getting to worship together um, in this way, but I have to tell you, I am so pumped for the fairgrounds coming up on August 16th. If you are pumped for the fairgrounds, I don't know, put an exclamation point, an emoji, something celebratory in the chat. I cannot wait um, to actually be able to gather together in this safe way on the 16th and and see one another and worship together. We're going to have an extended time of worship, which is going to be awesome. Uh, We're going to hear a very hope-filled message, which we all could use. We have this opportunity um, to invite our friends and our neighbors. Man, if, if you're someone who calls Mission Home, what an incredible opportunity we have. I mean, I've been hungry for this, for a place, for a space to be able to invite people, and we've got it. So like Becky said, invite, invite, invite everybody in your world. Um, We're going to show up at the fairgrounds, and we're really going to have this opportunity to praise God and to be together and to be filled with hope. And I cannot wait for it. Just a little bit excited. Um, If you're new to Mission, welcome. My name is Jody, and I'm a little crazy and out there. Sorry about that. Um, But we're a community of people around here that just believe that anyone is welcome and that no one is perfect, but we believe change is possible because there's hope for everyone. That's who we are. And a lot of things in life get overrated, right? But hope is not one of them. I mean, we know that in this season, how much we need hope right? A light at the end of the tunnel. And this hope that we have as a community is tied to a person. The hope that we have is not tied to an outcome or a circumstance. It's tied to the person of Jesus Christ, who we believe God sent his only son into the mess of this world. And that through his life and through his death and through his resurrection, we now have a living hope for this life right now, no matter what comes at us and for eternal life with him long after we're gone. And that is our good news. That is our hope. And what we've been doing during this series is just looking at some of the words of Jesus because he is our living hope. Some of them are printed in red letters in our Bibles. That's why we're calling this series Red Letters. But we're specifically looking at a passage, a message he gives where he's addressing a huge crowd of people, some of them curious, uh, some of them skeptical, young, old, some of them are excited. Uh, Some of them have already been touched by Jesus and they are all in. Um, Some of them have just showed up trying to discredit him. I mean, there's all kinds of people there in the crowd that day when Jesus begins to teach. And when he begins to teach, he taught like no one had ever taught before. And he's saying these countercultural things about what it means to really live a blessed life. And it's blowing people's minds. And we've said every week of this series that what Jesus said leads to a blessed kind of life is not at all what any of them on that day or any of us would think of when we think of, you know, hashtag blessed. That's not it. Jesus says things like, you know what, blessed are the poor in spirit. And blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And today we get to these words where he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I think it's important for us to remember that like while we're going through this series and we're taking on these statements, you know, that Jesus said just one at a time, this is like one whole sermon. Like, Jesus didn't stop and take a week off. This isn't a whole bunch of broken up sermons. This is one whole thought, one whole message from Jesus. And so they flow out of one another. And we have to remember that, that blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, you know, realize that they're busted, realize their spiritual poverty, realize that they're bankrupt without God. Blessed are those people. Blessed are those who mourn, who are broken, who grieve over their sin who are repentant, you know, that that mourn over the fact that they're poor in spirit without God. Blessed are the meek, those who have decided now to hand the reins of their life, hand control of their life over to God because they've decided, man, he's much better at leading my life than I am. Without him, I'm broke and I'm busted. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for to know God and to know his right ways. That that's just naturally what happens when we hand control of our life over to God. We start to develop this appetite, the way that he leads us into his right ways. 
And out of those first, you know, four things that we've looked at already in this series and who we want to become in living this blessed life, living this full life that Jesus promises us, we start to see now as we progress throughout this message, we start to see it spilling over. You know, like we talked about last week when we said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Filled just starts spilling over. And so now we start to see that it's not only just about our vertical relationship with God and what he does for us, but this blessed life that Jesus is talking about is communal. And this hunger that we have for God now in relationship with him and for his right ways, it starts playing out, it starts spilling out in things like becoming merciful people. It starts playing out in things like purity, as we'll see next week. It starts spilling out into becoming peacemakers. And so I just want to keep bringing us back to where we've been and how this is one whole message so that we don't lose sight and think that today, you know, becoming merciful isn't just like, so, you know, be merciful. Like, be nicer, do better, uh, try harder, don't cut off anyone in traffic anymore. That's, you know, what we're talking about is something that's flowing out of who we're becoming. What we're talking about today in becoming merciful people is something that flows out of the life of someone who knows they need the hand of God, has been comforted by the hand of God, has given control over to the hand of God, and is now hungry for the ways of God. The result of that is that we become merciful people. People who now have mercy and express mercy to one another. It's something that I've learned along the way as I've gotten to know God more and to know how amazing he is and know, understand his, his deep love for me and, and to know how to see myself and who I am without him. I've learned that mercy, this idea of mercy, it comes from mercy. Like it's hard to be a merciful person if I don't understand how much I need mercy. It's hard for me to dispense mercy if I don't first recognize, man, I'm a recipient of mercy. And that's all of us. We all need mercy. Without God, we are all broke, poor in spirit, busted. But God in his great mercy has not given us what we deserve but instead he's given us grace, he's given us kindness, he's given us compassion, he's given us freedom, he's given us healing, he's given us his leading, he's given us his peace, and all of that is mercy because we don't deserve any of it. And the key to becoming merciful is knowing how much you need and have received mercy. We like get this power to, to spill out, to show mercy, from the authentic place in us that knows, man, we owe everything we are and everything we have to the sheer divine mercy of God. We didn't earn it. We didn't achieve it. We will never be good enough for it. We just get to receive it because we have a merciful God. And when we begin to live our lives through that kind of lens, Mercy comes from mercy. That being merciful people, people that are full of mercy, what that means is it's going to change. It's going to change the way that we see each other. It's going to change the way we speak to each other. It's going to change the way that we treat each other because something new is spilling out. Being merciful means that we are able to step into someone else's life sit in their perspective, serve out of their need, see through their eyes, and see them through the eyes of Jesus. Mercy enables us to look at one another, and before we see race, before we see age, before we see background, before we see rich, poor, left, right, Republican, Democrat, young, old, educated, uneducated, we see image bearers of God. We see people that Jesus died for. 
we see siblings. We see brothers and sisters. We see value. We see worth. And I am so thankful that when Jesus showed up and walked this planet, he was full of mercy. And he saw people like no one else, and he shows us what it means to see people with mercy. Jesus spotted a hated tax collector up in a tree, and he was hated by everyone, but Jesus said, you want to have lunch? He saw him. He saw a woman desperate for healing that others had outcast, and he called her daughter. He gave recognition to a widow. No one else would have given a second glance. He saw fishermen and thought they were world changers. He saw the faith of a paralyzed man when others just perceived his sin. He set eyes on two sisters who were grieving and he stopped and he wept with them. Jesus locked eyes with the adulterer, with the, with the cheat, with the prostitute, with the broke, with the self-righteous, with the possessed, with the hurting, with the sick, with the up and out, with the down and out. And he met them all with mercy. He called them by name. And that's what he's done for every single one of us. And the more that we become like Jesus, the more we start living this way of Jesus, the more we ought to see each other through the eyes of Jesus and respond how he would respond. And man, we complicate this, right? Because we're living in a culture today where this is so countercultural. That's why Jesus said, you're gonna have to keep coming back to my words. Because right now we live in a culture where we're looking for flaws in each other. Where we're looking to judge somebody. We're looking to critique, we're looking uh, to criticize, we're canceling each other. I mean, it's, it's pretty merciless out there in our world and it's not the way of Jesus. I love how Jesus uncomplicates things of mercy in a story he tells in Luke chapter 10. Um, It says, on one occasion, there was this expert in the law that stood up to Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, so this guy, um, expert in the law, which means religious law, and it tells us that he was there um, to test Jesus. So this is why he shows up and why he asked the question. Like, this was a man who thought he had all the answers, uh, probably already assumed he had eternal life, thought he was good with God. He just wants to see what Jesus is going to say because he really wants to discredit Jesus and, and his following that he's gaining. And so he, he says this question just to test him. And you'll notice throughout scripture, almost always when someone is testing Jesus, he answers their question with a question. And that's what he does here. Jesus responds, well, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Like, You're the expert, (laughs) and I know you already think you got this. So what do you think? How, How do you read it? What's your opinion on the matter? And the guy answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. This is the way to eternal life. Like, you got it. This is the blessed life. Way to go. High five. Ten points for you. Jesus is like, you got it. And he starts to walk away. And the guy's like, hold on, wait wait just a second. Because he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, "But, but who is my neighbor? Like, who is my neighbor exactly? Right? Which, which people do I have to love, you know, as myself? Like, narrow this down for me, Jesus, because some would say that a neighbor is like someone who lives close by. Others would define neighbors as other Jewish men like me. Is it them? Other other people would say it's only people that are ceremonial clean. Those are just my neighbors, other believers. And he's doing the thing, right? He's he's doing the complicating it thing. And so Jesus says, okay, hold on. Um, Let me just tell you a story. And in reply, Jesus says, Here's a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. So the story that Jesus is telling is is totally made up. Jesus is making it up. But he's using an actual road 
that this guy would have been familiar with, the people there would have been familiar with. This road to Jericho was 17 miles long. It was super steep. It was super dangerous. It actually descends like 3,300 feet as you travel it. And it's kind of known for this sort of thing. So he's saying, here's this guy. You guys can picture it. You've seen it probably before. He's traveling a dangerous road and he gets robbed. He gets stripped, he gets beaten, and he's left half dead, right? Or for those of you Princess Bride fans, he's he's only mostly dead at this point. He's, He's mostly dead. And he's laying there. And he's wondering if anybody's gonna be willing to help him get up and get on a road towards recovery. And Jesus continues, you know, lucky day for this guy. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So a priest in that day, Jesus is stepping on some toes. This was the highest religious leader, highest ranked religious leader. And Jesus doesn't tell us why he didn't stop. He just says that the priest did see the man, naked, beaten, half dead. And he passed him by on the other side of the road. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and he saw him pass by on the other side. A a Levite, another religious official, passed by too. Why? We don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us that they passed by because, you know, they made assumptions about the man. He doesn't tell us if they were scared for their own life. He doesn't tell us whether they were super busy or whether they were tired or whether they thought he deserved it or whether they had already helped a bunch of other people that day. He just says that they saw him and they passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, Jesus continues, and this would have made like the whole crowd gasp, because they can tell where Jesus is going with this. And Samaritans and Jews had all kinds of beef. And Samaritans were hated by the Jewish people at the time. They were discriminated against because of their race, um, because of the way that they worshiped. They were considered outsiders. They were enemies to one another, all kinds of bad blood. And so Jesus just throws this curveball right in. He's like, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, He took pity on him and he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then Jesus asked the expert the most brilliant question. He says, which of these Three, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had, here's our word, mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. And if there had been like, you know, a mic drop back in the day, this is where Jesus dropped the mic He says, don't overcomplicate this. Go, live like that. Don't try to avoid people. Don't see pain and pass by. Have mercy. You've heard us um, say this around here before, describe this word, this Greek word that is pretty much used interchangeably in the New Testament for the words compassion and for the word mercy. And it's this weird word, splachna. Okay, that's how you say it. Isn't that an awesome word, splachna? It's related to the Greek noun that that says it's our inward parts. Like it's somewhere deep in us. It's the center of our personal feelings and emotions. It literally means like this kind of mercy is like a churning somewhere deep. It's a churning in your gut. Like it makes you feel sick to your stomach. It's this deep emotional response. It's the word that's most used to describe how Jesus felt when he saw hurting people, when he saw hungry crowds, sick, lost, lonely people, that it didn't just make him, you know, tear up and feel for them. No, it stirred something deep within him that moved him to act. 
That is what real mercy is. When we are willing to step into the place of another, to really see each other, then there's this stirring in our gut that moves us into action. It moves from our eyes to our hearts, to our minds, to our wallets, to our hands, to our feet. And you just gotta, you know, splock not all over somebody because it's just churning in there and you have to live it out. You have to extend mercy. And that kind of merciful living, that's what's gonna mark us as followers of Jesus. When I reread that story this week, you know, wanting to become a merciful person, it stood out to me when Jesus said, hey, he's the neighbor because he had mercy on him. It stood out to me that Jesus described the mercy of this good Samaritan as, as personal, right? Like in contrast to the other two guys who saw the man and then went to the other side of the road, Jesus says when the Samaritan saw him, he took pity on him. He had that mercy thing going on in his gut. He took pity. He had empathy. He was able to put himself in that man's place. He thought, wait, what if I was a victim of crime? What if I had been beaten up? What if I couldn't make it up on my own? The Samaritan didn't think, man, that's rough, but that's his problem. No, he made it personal. And mercy moves us like that. It doesn't fly past the pain of others. It stops. He also describes the Good Samaritan's mercy as practical. That he actually met the man where he was and addressed his actual needs. Like he didn't stop, you know, and think I'm being merciful. Let me give him some advice about traveling this road and the best times to travel this road. He doesn't lecture him on how dangerous it is to be out here. He doesn't give him a self-help book on like how not to get mugged. Like, no, he, he goes to him and he bandages him up and he gets him to a hotel and he takes care of him and he pays for the room and then he circles back to make sure that he's okay. Mercy is putting ourselves in the place of others and then serving out of what their need is. I have a friend um, whose wife's grandmother somehow got it in her head uh, that he really loves lemon pies. Okay, um, he doesn't. He actually doesn't like lemons or anything about lemon pies. Doesn't even really like pie. But every time they go visit now, she can't wait to give him his lemon pie. I mean, she makes it special for him. She tells him, like, I've got your lemon pie. And then when, you know, he shows up, she just can't wait, you know, to watch him eat it. Like, I got to watch him enjoy this lemon pie. And he's literally just trying to choke it down. And I've been guilty of that kind of thing when it comes to mercy. That I've just given what I've wanted to give instead of what someone needs. Where I've set a cross from people. Maybe from someone who is sharing their pain with me. And I've jumped right to giving advice. Here's a book you should read. Let me fix this for you. Let me give you my opinion on that. Here's a Bible verse to help. Just serving them up something that they don't even want to digest right now in the moment. Dishing up some lemon pie. But if I took some time to sit where they sit, maybe I would realize how to serve them. Oh man, what they really need is just somebody to listen. Or maybe what they really need is someone just to sit here and cry with them. Or what they really need is somebody to watch the kids for a few hours. Or what they really need is a meal delivered tonight. Mercy sees the other person and serves those needs. Not just gives what feels good to give. What this man also did in this story was extravagant. I don't mean like... He put him up in some swanky, you know, five-star resort, you know, kind of extravagant, but it did cost him something. His time was interrupted. I mean, who knows where this guy was heading before he saw the guy. His next, whole next few days looked different. He went out of his way. He put him on his own donkey. Bandages, wine, oil, all cost money. He covered the cost of the inn. He reimbursed um, any expenses. And when Jesus includes the detail that he gave the innkeeper two silver coins, he's saying that was a lot. 
He put that detail in the story to say, this was a guy, this is what mercy looks like. This was a guy who spent 14 days worth of wages at the time to pay room and board for someone who was supposed to be his enemy. That is extravagant. And that's mercy. And listen, mercy comes from mercy. This is exactly what Jesus has done for us. This is exactly the way Jesus has had mercy on us. It's personal, it's practical, and it's extravagant. He saw, he moved, he loved. It cost him his life. And because of his great mercy for us, that's where we get the capacity to become merciful and to live this out. Romans, five and, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At just the right time. While we were still powerless, not after we got ourselves cleaned up, not after we figured it out, but while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. And we can never forget that. That is mercy. I mean, anybody else besides me gone down a dangerous road in life, a road you never should have been on, and ended up beaten up by life or by your bad decisions or intentionally hurt by someone else? Listen, spiritually speaking, we, we've all been dead in our sin, in a ditch powerless to get ourselves out. Yet God in his mercy saw us and saved us. And now we love because we are loved and we show mercy because we've been shown mercy and we have compassion because of God's compassion on us. We comfort because we've been comforted. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Ephesians chapter five where it says, therefore be imitators of God as his beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Be imitators of God. That this blessed life is about starting to look a lot more like him. Because we're his dearly loved children. And so now walk in love. Walk in peace. Walk in mercy. You know, here's the truth. Whatever we're walking around in, that's what we're going to track around. Like, you know this if you've ever stepped, you know, in dog mess and then, you know, realized it when you walked into your friend's house, which that's not what we want to do, right? But, but this is something that we do. If we walk around in self-pity right now, that's what we're going to be tracking around. We walk around in insecurity, that's what we track around. We walk around in our failure, in our past rejection, we're tracking it around. If we walk around in judgment, in selfishness, in pride, in our own mess, that's what we're tracking around. But listen, if we walk around in the love of God, if we spend time there, if we walk around in the mercy of God and realize how much we need it and how much we've received it, that's what we're gonna end up tracking all over this community. And wouldn't that, be amazing. I mean, can you imagine? Just imagine for a second. Like if just our church did this, like just this church community, if we just started to become merciful people in this world and it started changing the way that we see each other and speak to each other and treat each other, can you imagine in this community if, 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 just, if we just became people full of mercy because we know we've been shown mercy. And we start to extend that very personally and very practically and extravagantly. Man, I believe that is just what this world needs. I believe that could change our city, change our community, change our world if we could start living that out. And it's what Jesus said would be a blessed kind of life. Let me pray for us. God, I'm so grateful for your mercy. Thank you for making a way for me when there was no way. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. Thank you for pulling me out of the pit of despair. God, I recognize I do not deserve any of it, and I thank you for your mercy. God, would you stir in our hearts right now to become people that in response of mercy, 
we live it out. We live out merciful lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.